Amen. Welcome. Good morning. Great to see everyone here today. Um, just a couple of announcements from your bulletin. The, um, well, this is not in your bulletin, this particular, uh, this particular announcement. And that is um, there's going to be a concert from the series The Chosen. How many people got to see The Chosen? A phenomenal, a phenomenal uh, series on the life of Christ. It's done like no other series I've ever seen. It's, it's just awesome. So tonight there's going to be a concert um, from this series. So it's going to be on the birth of Christ. And, and the second season is actually um, under filming right now. So I'm not sure when that's going to start. So be looking for that. But um, if you need instructions on how to locate this concert, go to the Word of Grace Facebook page. So that's where we can, you can be directed. I think it's going to be on YouTube, but there'll be a specific link or direction to get onto it um, t tonight. So that's tonight at what time? 8 o'clock tonight. So that might be great for you, you and your family to watch um, from the Chosen series tonight. Um, also, um, on our Facebook page, you can be, you'll be directed to the Christmas star. The Christmas star is going to be appearing on December 21st. On December 21st, two planets are going to align, Jupiter and Saturn, the two largest planets in our solar system. So it's going to be very bright. And they're calling it the Bethlehem star. And this is going to occur on December 21st. So there's instructions on exactly where to look in the sky and what um, direction. It's going to be in the west, um, <clears throat> in the evening, twilight, at sundown, for one hour. So. Hopefully, hopefully it won't be cloudy, but the last time, I don't know, some of you maybe missed the last one because uh, the last one was in 1226. Anyone see that one? No. I saw, I got to see the tail end of it, end of it but, um, but uh, the, and the one before that was, um, Jerry informed me, was at zero AD. I don't think anyone saw that one, right? <clears throat> so you won't get a chance. In, in the Bethlehem, the original Bethlehem star, was, uh, they're saying, is, was the alignment of three planets. And it actually lasted for um, several days, right? How many weeks? Many weeks? 70 weeks? That, that one lasted. I'm not sure exactly why. It was perhaps miraculous because that's what directed the wise men to, the, to Christ. Um, so this is all on the uh, Word of Grace Facebook page if you want more information and be directed to this. So I, I was in preparing for just my short little message, had no idea. I was completely informed this morning about these celestial occurrences, but I was contemplating celestial incur occurrences. I'm not sure why. Um, <clears throat> this, this morning as I was pre preparing my little message and, um, you know, there were over 300 prophecies concerning the birth of Christ in the Old Testament, which, which is pretty amazing. I, one of my favorite prophecies is that in Luke 2.32, that he would be a light to lighten the Gentiles. And, you know, I, I thank God so much every day for that prophecy that we uh, have the gospel message, we have the light of the world, that we no longer walk in darkness, but we have the light of light in John 8, 12. Um, it's, we are privileged to walk in the light as he is in the light. And many people take that for granted, but so many people are living in confusion, so many people are living in darkness, so many people are living in fear during this time, but that is not our lot because he's not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. Um, so this is what we live in because we are grounded in the reality of truth and the reality of our faith in him. Um, <clears throat> we know that he created in Genesis 1, 3, 2 great lights, one to rule the day, one to rule the night. And we understand that the, the moon, the one that rules the night is reflected light. And he's called all of us to be reflected light. The moon is constantly facing the sun, even though we don't we see the moon in various phases based on our position from where we are. And, you know, as we look to the Lord, as we face the Lord, <clears throat> we see him every day. We have that privilege to, in a sense, fully face the Lord and fully live in his light and the reality of his truth each day. Yet I think the world might look at us and see us in very, the various phases, the waxing and waning phases, because they don't understand truth. They don't understand reality until they, be, until they allow the light of the world to enter their hearts. 
And we wonder why there can be so many different worldviews and so many different perspectives about reality, about what's taking place in the world. And it really comes down to <clears throat> our perspective, our viewpoint, our worldview. And if our worldview <clears throat> is ruled, if you will, or directed <clears throat> from above, from divine viewpoint, then we see reality in the light of truth. And we're, and we're not speculating, well, it could be because of this, it could be this, this is happening. We don't wonder what's happening. We know the reality of truth from the word of God. But, you know, what we're seeing perhaps um, in our country, even at this point in time, was not unusual. It's not unusual for the world, and it's not unusual for, for a lot of countries uh, that exist right now in the world. And, and uh, for much of people's lives, people have lived in darkness. And darkness represents in the scriptures oppression, uh, it could be affliction, it could be destruction, it could be misery. It's all of these circumstances that people go through that are, are difficult. And perhaps we see one on the horizon um, in our own country that there could be a very, very dark time. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and it won't surprise us because the world has, has lived in darkness for so much of the time. As a matter of fact, in First John 5, 19, the whole world lies in wickedness. So, and, we, and we see Israel uh, in its day through the eyes of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, <clears throat> um, basically indicating to the nation that there would be coming judgment for their behavior, that there would be consequences to their turning away from God because they didn't walk in the light that they were given. God would bring in enemies. You know, in, in, in Proverbs chapter, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 8, I was considering <clears throat> the invasion the assyrian invasion that was about to take place in israel and at that point in time in verse 20 of isaiah chapter 8 isaiah said to look to god's instructions and teachings people who contradict his word are completely in the dark and see we see this in our nation today that people are completely contradicting the word of god and they're, and they're living in the dark. They, they have not allowed the light of the reality of truth to enter into their being, into their hearts. <clears throat> and then there, there will be this perspective in, in two verses later, verse 22. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. The, the point in time when Christ came on the scene was a time of complete darkness in the world. It was perhaps one of the darkest darkest times, if not the darkest time in the history of the world, when Christ entered as the light of the world. So there was this tremendous contrast that was evident and obvious to all those who were looking for the Messiah, all those who would desire to embrace truth, all those who would desire to experience the, the fullness of peace and joy and love in, in the light of the world, that he, so, he wanted to usher in to this world. And we see him doing that. We see him doing that in First Corinthians chapter 4, the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness in Genesis 1-3 has shined in our hearts. He has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great Christmas verse? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. We look at the babe in the manger, the face of Jesus Christ, and we see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. We see that God would actually send his son. He would part with his only begotten son to send him into this world to be a light unto the Gentiles, to, to allow us to experience salvation, to allow us to experience peace. And we can be living in a world that's full of darkness, yet not be full of darkness. We are no longer darkness, but now we are light. He's translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And this is our reality. And so, many, so much of the world, so many people just are so confused. They're so fearful. I mean, talk to your neighbor. Talk to any, either side of your house, in front of your house. Talk to them and see what they think. They don't think like we think. They don't think in the light because, you know, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, would shine unto them. And what differentiates a person in this day and age from having rest and peace and hope and abundant life 
is that we have this faith in an unchanging God who has imparted to our soul the light of heaven, the light of the kingdom of God, the light of his glory, and we walk in that and experience who he is, not what's taking place in the world around us. Amen? Lord, we thank you this morning that we have this light. Lord, this light that you've given us. Lord, you are the true light. You enlighten every man coming into the world in John 1, 9. And we thank you, Lord. The people who walked in darkness in Isaiah 9, they have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has this light shined. Thank you, Lord, this morning for shining your light upon us. Thank you for giving us the light of your son, your dear son, the light of hope, the light of eternal life. Lord, we thank you this morning. We praise you. We ask that you just bless each one now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's turn to John chapter 1 for the Christmas story this year in your Bible. How's everybody doing? That's a good answer. That was what I was looking for. Blake's a, Blake's a good student. I have no idea. God knows. Well, we are here to get built up to see Jesus, to let that light of the glorious gospel shine into our hearts. For the glory of God, Pastor Steve used one of my verses for today. I will reuse it. Most of my family shops at the Salvation Army anyway, so I might as well reuse things, right? Good to do. But we're going to look at the gospel and the Christmas story in John. Now, I know for most of you, uh, that's not the place you go for Christmas, is it, right? Everybody know that? Where don't you go in the gospels for Christmas story, supposedly? You go in Luke, where else? Matthew, right? There you got the traditional Christmas story. But, you know, we don't like tradition too much. We like it, but not as much as truth. So we're going to stay with John and give the Christmas story from God's perspective because that's really the only perspective that matters. So let's say a prayer. I really want you to focus in today. Uh, like any message, it may change your life. We're about life-changing. We received God a long time ago if we're saved, right? But in this text, it is the believing or the faith that grows from faith to faith, the scriptures say. That's the transforming agent to make you better and ultimately the best, right? You have to believe, receive. You've got to meet somebody before you know about them, and then the whole quest of your life is to know him, right? What did Paul say? One thing I do, to know him. I press on to know him. Someday I'll see him face to face, John would write, and I'll know even as I'm known. But right now, we're about building ourselves up in what? Jude would say, the most holy faith. That's how we get better. That's how we have courage. So we're going to pray today that we can have greater faith when we leave this building for what's before us. So Heavenly Father, this is a Christmas like none other. Uh, we are all hiding our face like that veil in that same passage that Pastor Steve uh, talked about right before that is the idea that we all have a veil over our face in chapter 3. But God, when the veil is removed, we see you and we're illuminated. So we pray, Lord, today you would pull back the veil a little bit, Lord, that we may see you. No man's seen you at any time. But the Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, you have declared him. And so, Lord, we look to you towards that declaring today and that changing in our life. We're not perfected yet, but we purify ourselves till that day. So, God, give us ears to hear today. We just pray right now that the Holy Spirit would be real. He'd be the great, great communicator through the Word and the Word made flesh. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The traditional Christmas story that we all love is really found in those two Gospels. We are looking at John. I thought it would be great to look at John for Christmas. Uh, we're going to preach two messages out of this. 
And one really is about the word and the light. We're going to get into today. And then the second message we'll preach next week is about the life. Three major words he uses, the life, the word, the light, the life, and then ultimately the glory. That's what Christmas is all about. And we're looking at John because it really goes great to look at John being we're just we're in his great book of Revelation. The Alpha and the Omega of the Bible are what? Genesis, the created reality of God. He has made a dimension. Let's put it in dimensional reality. We'll be a little bit of Einstein this year. Uh, he has made a reality of a material world. But he was before the material world, was he not? He existed before what is, is. He was. And he will be. He is an eternity. We are not, though we're eternal beings, we are not him. We are what? Created beings, aren't we? And we look towards the eternal because he is the one who came in in that eternal being. So he is the eternal God. Uh, this really becomes God's viewpoint of who Christ is. John is the best writer of who Christ is. He doesn't really begin his writings to almost the time Jerusalem falls. Uh, he is in Jerusalem, you know, taking care of Mary. We don't know how long Mary lived after Jesus' crucifixion and death and resurrection. But that was his main priority. I would say if God Almighty told you to do something and you believed in him, I think you would do that to the end, right? Noble thing. You know, that's where we get noble, the care of older people. God counts it noble. I always look at that, that John gave his best, or Jesus gave his best disciple would write these books, which are the greatest books, because they reveal Christ to the maximum, he would give years of his life to his mother to take care of his mother. Then give it to one of his brothers. He says, John, you take care of my what? Mother. And the Bible says from that day on he went to John's house. Great nobility. Great anti-euthanasia, uh, euthanasia, right? Is the word, yeah? that Jesus cared that much to give his best. Uh, God sees value in people. He sees ba ba value in uh, the idea of anti-pragmatism. He sees value in the unborn. True? He holds them up. He was in the womb. He was formed in the womb, like Jeremiah was formed in the womb. God gives great value to the birth of mankind whether it's bios life or whether it's zoe life. He wants bios life to become what? Zoe life, which is eternal life. Bios life is your physical life, but bios life is the only life that has the potential to become what? Zoe life, eternal life. It's the transition that is the key. And the transition is the gospel, isn't it? When we look at the book of Mark, there's a great line there. If you look at Mark chapter 1 in your Bible, you just want to flip there, hold your place in John 1. But Mark chapter 1, just to give relevance to these two uh, great gospels, which we definitely need and show more and more about who Christ is, he starts out with the same words as does John here and also Genesis, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I mean, that's loaded by itself. Because the whole plan of God has always been the gospel. What's the gospel? The good news. Has God ever not been good? Now, I want you to get this thing because you, you don't get this. We talk about the glory of God. The end result is the glory of God. But let's define what the glory of God is in the Scripture. I don't even remember the passage where Moses can't go any farther. He says, listen, I can't take care of these people anymore. Show me your what? Glory. So the greatest definition of the word, the person who is the word, made flesh, gives the answer to Moses. Do you remember what he said to Moses? 
He says, I can't show you my glory because no man has ever seen me and you can't live. But then he says this. He says, this is my glory I'll give you. And this is really my glory. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Isn't that an awesome thing? I will make all my goodness pass before thee. See, that's what the gospel is. The glory of God is goodness passing before you, being revealed to you in the face of Jesus Christ. Before the worlds were made, the gospel was written by God. You understand that? Because intrinsically, the goodness of God is who He is. How good is He? He's infinitely good. I'm good enough to be good to every one of you. Logistically, in the bios life, He makes the rain to shine on the good and the evil, does He not? Because the evil is even bios life corrupted. And yet the bios life that rejects God, He holds His hand up still, doesn't He? That's His goodness. It passes before all mankind. John will give the viewpoint, and John is the best writer of the defender of the nature or the humanity of God and the proclaimer. He is the greatest proclaimer of the incarnation of all the writers. Paul's amazing with it. We just quoted... Pastor Steve quoted a whole portion about the light and darkness shining before you, the light of the glorious what? Gospel. That if it's veiled, it can't come in, but when the veil again, God wants to shine in the darkness of this world. And this world is very dark and getting darker, but so was it at, at, so was it at the time of Christ, was it not? I mean, do you ever think how courage, courageous God is? I mean, Jesus Christ lands in his most frail state possible, a newborn baby behind enemy lines. Right? And the whole world wants to kill him of Satan, right? Under Satan's control. Aren't you glad he didn't come in and quarantine for 14 days? Aren't you glad he wasn't born with a mask on? Right? God is courageous and he expects his people to be courageous in the middle of any darkness that's in this world. And you have to build yourself and talk to yourself and be strong in the grace of God that you're able to face whatever comes at you. I mean, we still have people for this Christmas season. You know, if you want to, I'd like to organize and I know it's been talked and I know there's a million reasons not to do it. We're too close together. My God, a molecule could fly through the air and get somebody. I, I know all, I know all the reasons. I can think that much in my life, and at the same time, because of the gospel, I could care less. I really could. I could care less. I care about you living the gospel more than hiding in your basement with your protection of your little mediocre bios life, which you'll die anyway. I care more that you live for eternity and reveal it now than I do about your bios life. Do I care about your bios life? Yeah. I'm not trying to be stupid. At the same time, there's a ridiculousness in the whole thing, isn't there? And there's hypocrisy everywhere. Wear a mask, I'm fine with that. If you want to wear a, a chicken fence around your, your uh, face to protect you from a mosquito, great. You know, if you think that's going to save you, great. And that's fine. The world thinks so. You ever see how crazy we are with the world? I mean, we love the Christmas story, right? John writes after all those stories are written, and he doesn't mention, and this is Christmas really, here we read John 1, this is Christmas without uh, the angels singing or speaking loudly, as the scriptures say, they say they sing, without the manger scene. Goes <gasps> up every year in my house, there's the manger scene, I like the manger scene. <sighs> without the wise men, Christmas without the wise men. I mean, most of your cards are all what? Wise men, right? That's all fitting, right? This and that. But the world does that. Usually they have Santa all over it, which is crazy by itself, right? Satan gets in 
to Christmas. Satan ruins every parade. That's why we remember we talked about Revelation when God reigns on Satan's parade with an earthquake. I love that. Because every parade God has, Satan does what? Counterfeits and reigns on it, doesn't he? He gives us satanic nick, right? Did you ever think you could spell Satan with Santa? You ever think that? It, it's a change of letters. It was developed by, by Charles Dickens a little bit with one of the spirits, but then Coca-Cola took it on. You know, people didn't believe in Santa Claus like you do. They didn't have the, the red Coca-Cola thing. That happened in the, uh, what, 30s? That all America was brainwashed into Santa Claus is coming. And that song went with it. You ever think about that song, how it's almost like gives Santa supernatural powers? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. How about this one? He knows if you've been bad or good. See, I even can quote it. It's not many songs I can quote. But be good. Because you are good. Being perfected. No, you're not good. Jesus came to die for you because you weren't good. And you couldn't be good. That's the gospel. That's Romans 1 and 2. Nah. Be good for goodness sake. You better watch out. Yeah, that's called Satan and Xmas, right? I love the Apostle Paul for that, for that verse he quoted in 2 Corinthians. I love it, you know, in the sense that Paul changes and he doesn't really say Jesus as much as he always puts the Christ. The Christ. The Christ. In other words, the God side of the divinity of Jesus Christ first he's christ he's not just you people love people in churches i love the little baby jesus is that your faith i love the drama story i like it because you know what i i, I tell you god comes into a material world and he uses material things to draw us but he doesn't leave us there he draws us into another dimension far greater far more everlasting than any drama show this world has he uses things. He uses baptism. We go in the water. But there's a far greater meaning than that, isn't there? He uses communion. We take a cup of grape juice. We drink that, and we have some bread. And that's great. That's symbolic material, and it's useful. Because I am material, aren't I? But that's only reflective and some way to communicate deeper truths to me. That Jesus dies on a cross for me for my sins. And he pours out his blood for me and his flesh and his body was broken for me. But he uses material things. He uses a great story. I mean, the, the story, the nativity. Those are great stories. I mean, I love to watch them. I love to sing these songs. I grew up on these songs. If I sing them loud, because they're the only songs I was ever in a choir to sing. When I was a little fella with a robe on, and it was blue, and it was nice. And I had a music teacher, and she taught me how to sing and to go up, and, and I still, that's intrinsic in me from this high. And, you know, I love those songs. Those songs mean a lot. And the drama of, of the babe and being hunted and no place in the inn. All those things are tremendous stories and true. But the greatest story is from the other viewpoint of heaven, isn't it? God's viewpoint. Because without God's viewpoint, there is no viewpoint. There is no light to see. If it doesn't take me deeper into God and the real meaning forever and ever and ever, then it really is just another story, another Dickens classic, isn't it? And most of the world believes that. Do you know most of the world believes in Jesus? They just define who he is different than what God defines who he is. A billion Islamic people revere Jesus, but he's not God. The Mormons, who a hundred years ago weren't even let into Washington, by the way. You could even go to Washington, D.C. as a Mormon under like Teddy Roosevelt and stuff. Right? Could even do it. Because they were considered an extreme cult. They're still cultic. I don't care about Nick Romney and how far he goes. Thank God he didn't become president. Hallelujah. 
Mormons as president. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in this part. And this is intrinsic. And John is the greatest defender of this in all his writings. John is the one who will reveal Jesus, not as the little babe, which has been in Revelation, not as the little babe, but eyes of fire, right? Feet of brass. He's the only one who will apocalypse, totally unveil Jesus for who he is. He does it in his last book. He does it in his first book in the Gospel of John. What is the theme of the Gospel of John? He's the Son of God. That's the theme to the world. He's the son. Listen, that's the theme to the world. Not that he's a little babe in the manger. Isn't that cute? Yeah, it is cute. I like cute things. But I like better. He's the son of the living God. Equal and the same. Same. With him before this world began. Intrinsic to him. That's the gospel, and that's what has to be declared, and that's what isn't declared in all the world that believes in Jesus as some other thing than God. That is the hallmark of our faith, because if he's not God, just like if he's not resurrected, listen, if he's resurrected and he's not God, woe is you the same as woe if there's no resurrection. <laughs> because it took an infinite, pure God to die for the sins of the whole world, did it not? It had to be a sacrifice that God would receive. And that is the beauty of Christianity. That is the beauty of Christmas and Easter. The God-man. The God-man. And if we waver on that, then there is no Christianity. And if that's true, there is no what? There is no hope. Our hope is in Him. So John will start out, and remember who John is to get here. We're simply talking about the word and the light. John is in the Greek world. John lived in Jerusalem most of his life. I mean, he is my age, and he's still in Jerusalem. All he really knows are the Jews. He didn't mingle a lot with Romans, and Romans really didn't want to mingle a lot with you. All he knows is this world. And now he is leaving Jerusalem and he takes up residence in Ephesus, probably after Paul's death, probably what they're going through. He journeys there because most of the people were called to get out of Dodge, out of Jerusalem in that day, when the persecutions became greater and greater and the end was near that Rome was going to squash Israel. These guys went back into places they could go that were already pre-made by the Apostle Paul. And they went there to back up and strengthen the message. Paul, or John now is in what, a Greek world? What do you think John would do in a Greek world? He would be all things to all men, wouldn't he? Just like Paul became. Paul was a Jew of Jews. And what would Paul say? To the Greek, I became the Greek. Which means what? I'm going to bury myself and know everything about a Greek. That's a scary thought. I've been to Greece. <laughs> you ever been to Greece? That's a scary thought. But anyway, if you're Greek, hallelujah. God bless you. They argue all the time. But he said to the Greek, I became the Greek. I'm going to learn everything I can about the Greek so I could win the Greek. I want to know how they think. I want to know how they view reality. I've always looked at John 1 as a philosophy book, and the greatest philosophy is God, because philosophy is about the idea of seeing reality. It has an ontology, big word, learn what it means. It's how the world was made, or a cosmology, it's how the world beginnings happen, origins. And everybody has one. You have a viewpoint how the world was made. Even if you say, I could care less and I don't, I don't know, that's your viewpoint. It's stupid, but that's still you. I love when people say, I don't care. Well, maybe you will care. How about this? Maybe you should care, because you will care. You're responsible to care. What if God didn't care when it came into the world, right? And your ontology is how you view reality. Life, death, right? Existence, work, all the cultures you have, sociology, all those things. It's how you view reality. 
And that gives you what? Sanity and gives you what? Respond. All these things that are real intrinsic to it. How do you survive in this world? This is God's philosophy. But this is also the Christmas story. And so in the beginning, read with me, we'll read the first 14 verses here, maybe a little longer. In the beginning, he takes off of Genesis. And remember who he's preaching to. This, this is the gospel to the world. The Greeks have already had Zeus, right? And we used to watch Hercules with the ring. We talked about that with somebody the other day. You have the ring in the package. Remember the Hercules ring? My God, you people are too young. Well, you would go and you would go in the popcorn thing and you'd get the Hercules ring which was mighty power. That was the Greeks. They believed in Zeus. I loved Hercules. They believed in all those things, right? That's how they believed. Well, they grew out of that, and they grew into philosophers. Remember, how about this one? A little bit more for you guys. Socrates, right? Plato, Aristotle, the foundations of what? Philosophy. And when Paul went there, they were so far ahead of that, even though the Greek gods, they had no God, they liked the immorality like most people like. They realized that you couldn't know the Logos was the key and you couldn't know God. And so when Paul went to Mars Hill where the uh, Parthenon is, this, the uh, temple to Apollos, he went there and he did what? He, said he found a subscription on the side, modern art, saying, this is the temple stone saying to the unknown God. Because they believed you couldn't know God. But they believed there was a God. And this is what the world believes now, most people. But you have to be agnostic. Do you know what agnostic means? I'm ignorant. It's a great word to be. You might as well just say you're ignorant. You believe in God? I'm ignorant. Well, that's true. Okay. I'm ignorant. So you can say that to the next person that tells you agnostic. Oh, you're an ignorant person. Okay. God wants you to have knowledge of him shined forth, right, Pastor Steve, in the glorious gospel. And you are his witnesses, by the way, here now in this time age. So John 1, he's speaking to these people and he knows how they think. And so he goes a little bit to the Jew, which would know. And a lot of the Greeks knew the scriptures because, remember, there were a lot of bestseller books, libraries back then. Homer loved Song of Solomon. These philosophers read the Hebrew wisdom books. They understood some of them to a degree. But he goes back to Genesis 1, which if you destroy Genesis 1, you destroy all the rest of it. You destroy the beginning and the end. You got nothing. Nothing's a bad thing to have. But he says, in the beginning, just like Genesis 1 was what? The Logos, the Word the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is the pre-incarnate state of God and the state of the incarnate God. That He always was, and He always will be. And before anything was, He is. This is one of the, the eternality is one of the ideas of God that he is beginning and he never, he always has existed. Jesus claims this, John claims it through the Holy Spirit for the babe born into the world that he is God. He is preexistent of all existence. He goes on to define it and he gives the idea here to back it up with a witness. He says, listen, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, he gives them the backup because everything in the scriptures, everything with God backs it up. God doesn't just make statements in the air. I'm God. Well, how can you prove that? Because I said so. No, I'll tell you how I proved it. I made you. There's nothing made that was made that I didn't make. I didn't make myself. I always was. But I did make you. I did make everything in this good earth that's still good that God made. The sky, the trees, the sun. I made it all for you. The testimony that I always was and that I am is that I made. And you can see it in Psalm 19. 
that all of creation declares this to us, whether we like it or not. It gives witness and light to us, to it. So God's first testimony here is that he is the word. And the word to the Greek and to the world, the logos was always the idea, and still is, of an immovable, powerful, all-powerful force behind reality. Einstein believed this. Einstein was a pantheist. He was a Jew, but he was a pantheist. And he declared, like, you know, what, what's this all about creation? Him searching out the universe and all his theories of light that went on to make so many different things, including weapons of mass destruction, um, quantum physics. But he would look at it and he would say, do you believe? Okay, you have all this science. You're a genius. Do you believe in God? Of course. This place is too ordered. There's a force. There's a logos. There's intelligent design which has become the predominant view of most scientists that there's some intelligent design behind reality. Somebody had to make your eye, which no camera can reproduce, right? The beautiful pictures you take, it you still have to have the eye to see them, don't you? That eye can clean itself. You don't have to clean the lens. It cleans itself, doesn't it? That eye is just an amazing focusing, not machine, but creation of God. You study any anatomy, you see, like David saw in Psalm 139, when he quoted, I am marvelously made. Who made me? I cut myself and it heals, right? Right, Tony? There you are sleeping. Good, that's okay. You cut yourself and he begins to heal. He even grows teeth back. He doesn't even know. Third set of teeth. God made us, right? God made us. Marvelously made. In his image. And he keeps us so many times even when we don't believe in him, doesn't he? I mean, if I didn't hate you, hated you, and you cut yourself, I'd let you bleed out on the floor, right? Not God. To the wicked and the good, he does that. He is the Logos. And when he preaches this, he knows what he's preaching. And he knows the world he's preaching it to. And they understand that, listen, in the beginning was the Logos. We all know that. But the Word and the Logos is God. But he'll go down through to define what that Logos is as God. All things are made by him. But you have, they understood that. That's the unknown God. He's still unknown. In him was life. One of the great words here, life. And that life was the light, another great word of men. In other words, life that we're living begins to what? Illuminate us. The scriptures tell us that, that listen, in Psalm 53, 1, Psalm 14, 1, every man knows there's a God. There's a light in you, isn't there? Unbeliever or not. And the fool or the ignorant person says there is no God. And it goes on to say why, so he can be immoral. Because if I believe there's a God, I might believe that I'm responsible to the God that made me and keeps me by his grace. I don't really want to be responsible. All right, because this, this is academic. How about like committed? Yeah, you know how many people don't want to be committed? That's why people get married maybe at 40 or live together. Aren't you glad we have a God that is committed to this mess that we, along with Satan, have made of a good, a very good, by the way, creation? He's committed to the end. He's committed to cleaning up the mess, by the way. Aren't you glad? Don't you want to follow a God like that? Don't you want to defend a God like that? Don't you want to declare a God like that? Who else wants to clean up this mess? God. And he will. He won't do it as the little baby Jesus, by the way. Isn't that cute? He'll do it as the almighty king of kings. Revelation 19. And Lord of lords. He'll do it as that. God. And that's who he is. And that light shines in darkness. Pastor Steve was sharing that from 2 Corinthians 4. In the darkness. And the darkness will never comprehend it. 
There was a man sent from John. This man came as a witness to bear the witness of the light, and all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness to this light. Now, this is about five messages we're condensing into two, just in these verses about John the Baptist. Remember who John the Baptist was. He was the greatest and the last of the Old Testament prophets. The last definitely is first. He has one major job, to bear witness to Jesus Christ. He's a prophet like none other. He's Abrahamic in the sense that he's like Isaac. He's born of two parents that are ancient. Right? Everyone knows they're a barren. Everyone. They're old. And it's over. Remember we talked about that great last year about Zacharias, what, he, what he's in the... In the burning the incense, and the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Zacharias, your prayers have been answered. What's that? Steak for lunch? What's that? What prayer? Hear me for lunch, wherever you like? No. You're going to have a son. That's about like 40 years too late. I'm like ancient. And God makes him dumb, can't speak, because he didn't believe. You know when you believe, you don't speak. You know why a lot of people don't share the gospel, they're dumb? I don't like dumb people. The shoe fits, put it on. Don't be it, son. Then you reject that. Then you reject God. God told you to declare him. I'm preaching from God, not me. We should declare him. Jesus declares the Father. He's in the bosom. Are you in the bosom of God? Are you? Yeah. We need to declare him. He's the only hope of the, the whole world. And of you. And he came to be declared. And John's purpose is what? He's going to declare him. He... he what you, Zacharias doesn't believe, and he's made dumb. And then he goes home to Elizabeth. Well, the old girl is pregnant there, huh? Come on. And everybody knows he comes out, and he saw God, and he's dumb. And then they find out Elizabeth, who's way past the age, probably up to older, you know. I won't know how old it doesn't say, 100 years old, but she's way past having a kid. And she's having a baby. You don't think all Israel knew it. It spread around all Israel, this thing. And then they're, they're circumcising him. And what happens to old John boy? He begins to declare. Because he believes. Because the impossible happens. Do you know when you get saved, that's the impossible? I don't know if you dwell on things in your life. But I know it was impossible to get me saved. Unless God did it. I love darkness. And light shined into the darkness. Somehow, through God, I comprehended it. And I'm still trying to comprehend it. But I know I need to declare it like John. John is the greatest. And you know what? This is 400 years there hasn't been a prophet. 400 years. That's a long time. No prophet. The silent years in the scriptures. And all of a sudden, this miracle happens. What's John do? He goes into the wilderness and starts preaching. And all Israel knows the story. And they know there's a prophet in Israel again. And what's he preach? He doesn't preach Malachi. He preaches Isaiah 40. A voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Do you remember they go to him? They say, is this? Is this? Are you the one? They'll go later in this chapter. Are you the one? Are you that prophet? No, no. This is the prophet I am. I am Isaiah 40, not Malachi. I am a voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And that was John. And he's the last and the greatest. And Jesus gave him that name. He's the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets because he had the privilege to pave the way, defend the truth, 
and declare the Lord and even baptize the Lord. Remember that? That great story? It's you that should baptize me. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Dumb people don't declare him. Don't be dumb. I'm speaking to all of you, myself too. Let's be people that are not agnostic. We know the truth. We need to declare the truth. John is a declarer of who Jesus is. To the end, he declares. And he goes on, this man sent from God. He says, this light was the true light to every man that cometh into the world. This could be a lot of many theologians wrestle over this, but basically... I understand this, that light is coming to the world. Nothing grows without light. Everything mirrors the material world to the spiritual. Uh, light is power, by the way. A lot of people just think that this we have lights. Look, that's a light up there. We call it a light. But light is a movable force. It's always moving, by the way. That's why we have light years. I think it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 183,000 miles per second that light moves instantaneous to you. 186? Got off 3,000. It's quicker now. That's why I'm slow. Yeah, that's pretty fast. But they used to think light is something stationary. It's always moving. It's waves. It helps us see. It does a lot of different things. Like your blood is amazing. It does a lot of things in your body, right? It carries food to your body. It takes waste out. It, it heals. All those things, blood coagulates. It does all these things that you'd be dead. You're like a big sack. Of, you're like a big water balloon. You should just dish out, right? But blood is amazing. So was light. God made it. And he acknowledges that he's like light. There's the power of God. The power of God which we could see, but also the power of God to create in light. Remember what light does? The things. Nothing grows. We'd all be dead without light. Even if you could see. Without the sun, you'd all be dead. Even if we had light bulbs. The sun grows everything. It sends power to what? Give the increase to you putting a seed into the ground and watering it. Isn't that great? It's the same way having a kid. Wow, I had kids. Wow, that was amazing. How long did you study to have a kid? God gives the increase. Right? things we take for granted only God gives the increase and it's through light that he reveals that and it's through light he manifests that in reality to us by making things by creating things by maintaining your life all the things we take for granted maybe on Thanksgiving we thank him very heavy that day but we take for granted every day of our life that God through logistical common grace sustains in our life to keep it going despite our response to him by the way he keeps going and so light is lit to us to see its impact and to know it comes from God he's eternal He's revealed. There are six things here theologically. He's eternal. We just said that. He preexisted. He's revealed. This is what the light does. It reveals. It reveals through seeing and it reveals through being in what it does. It's power. Light is power. It's also spiritual power, not just material power. It comes from and made by a spiritual world. A dimension that we are trying to enter into in Christ. And God entered into on the what? The story of the babe is God entering in to a dark world, a spiritual being, the super spiritual being, entered into the world. Light is going to what? Bring the increase, which is the power of God. And Jesus is the light of what? The world, is He not? He reveals through the Holy Spirit but he also shows through the deeds which light manifests in the world. All the beauty, all the beauty of the flowers would never grow. The lily of the valley would never be there. The rose of Sharon would never shine unless the sun 
made it and created it. And God gave the increase for that, even for you to see it. Remember, blind people don't see many things, do they? And the unsaved state, which we're dawning out of little by little. Listen, you're all in an unsaved state in the sense that you were unsaved most of your life and you live in an unsaved world, don't you? When you get saved, it's like, it's like Paul on the road straight. Do you remember what happened to Paul on the road straight? When he was blinded by God, when he saw the full light of God? It's like the scales begin to fall off your eyes. That only happens when you walk by the perception of faith. Faith is the revealing light. As you trust God, you see more and more. As you don't trust God, you don't see anything. Darkness begins to prevail. If you're saved, light can never be diminished by darkness, right? But you can't see more and more light unless you walk by what? A relationship of faith with God. Very simple. It's a simple story, yet you could write like John writes. He writes these things in chapter 21. He says, I write these things that you might believe in the only Son of God. That's the only reason we preach, by the way. That you might believe that God became a man. Without that, there is no hope. And I could fill all the books. And it, I could fill the world with books about him. That's how amazing he is. Yet... He's as simple of a mo as a mother holding a newborn babe in love. He's this simple, yet he's beyond infinity in being profound what you could write about him. That's who Jesus Christ is. As I always say, he's big enough to be small enough to know me more intimately than anybody ever has. And he's big enough to know everybody in the world the same way. If you want to know him, there's the if, right? If you want to let him love you. Problem with any, anybody's, I can give you the number one problem with anybody in your life. Do you let God love you or do you love him? The measure you let God love you, the measure you love him. We love him because he first loved us. The measure you move in faith, because those things will all pass away when you see him. The only thing that remains is what, like you said last week, is love. You won't need hope because you'll see him. You won't need faith because he'll be right there. And as the prophets say, in that day all will know him from the least to the greatest. But love never fails. This will go on to write. The great chapter will end with this sometime, the next message that God so loved the world, right? That's the hope of it. That's the reality of it that he gave. That babe in a manger the most frail of things. He gave it for you. If he doesn't give it for you, he doesn't give it for anybody. He gave it for you. The true light came into the world. He was in the world and was made through him and the world did not know him. And he gave, came to his own and his own did not receive him. A tremendous verses here. There is a promise here that God fulfills in the sense that he came. So there is a great promise from all the prophets, John being the last one. I didn't want to miss that theologically. The fourth thing is he promises. John is the end prophet to reveal that promise. And then he comes. He said he would come. He came. But then he comes in, in this great, imagine coming like he did at the gate, you know, in, in the procession when he comes in. Uh, on Palm Sunday, he came into the world and there were no palm trees, were there? Laid at his feet. There was nothing. He came into the world and the fourth theological thing out of this chapter is he was what? Rejected. The world did not know him. Well, I'll go to my own people. Nah. You understand you have to be rejected? Some of you have... A lot of people, I will say some people, they, they're so affected about being rejected in life. Life is about being rejected, by the way. Most of you are all God's rejects. Or hell's rejects, that's even better, right? And then you find God accepted you. Right? Will somebody accept me? Isn't that great? No matter how you're rejected, in prison, no matter where, God says, I'll accept you. 
Jesus knows about rejection, by the way. How would you like to make the world? You sustain the world. You appeared in Epiphanies and in uh, Theophanies, they call it in the Old Testament, appearing of God in the Old Testament. You appeared in the Old Testament all many times to the prophets, the kings, and you get to the place, right? And now you're going to make your entrance into the world for the first time and nobody wants to know you. In fact, they want to kill you. We've all rejected Christ. We all weren't born saved, were we? We all weren't, weren't born good little girls and boys, were we? The first theology we knew about anything was it's mine. Right? Well, you got to go in any nursery and find out that. The most easy proved doctrine in the world, the sin nature. And the most denied. It's, it's amazing how stupid we are. It really is. And yet in the middle of that we have a Savior who knows all things. Who is the word Logos. And yet he receives us. And yet we rejected him. And yet the whole world rejected him. But the great hope of that is the salvation part. Isn't it? Verse 12. But as many as what? Received him. To them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who want believe on his name. And who did this? Was this was this the church who did this? No, it was not. Church can't save anybody. Church can't give absolution to anybody. Why? We're all a bunch of sinners. <laughs> you know, leopards can't heal leopards, I don't think. Right? Homeless people can't give Homeless people a home. Jesus has a home. Jesus is salvation, by the way. As many as received him, let him in. He gave what? The power, the light, the power, the moving logos force of God. Both mind and power. You know, power without a mind is kind of crazy, right? It's like you're always trying to keep the nuclear bombs away from crazy people, and there's so many crazy people in the world, right? A little Korean guy wants to get a nuclear bomb. That's like frightening. True? Imagine if Adolf Hitler got a, a nuclear bomb. We'd all be glowing right now, not with the light of God, right? And yet, who controls that? People? The will of man, the will of the flesh? This whole pot is controlled by God, whether you see it or not. If you see God, you see the control. And the liberality to let men still make their own mistakes and sin. But if you see God, you know the end is sure. What he says will come to pass. And so in the middle of that, as many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Not by anything. Look at this verse context here. <sighs> Who were born. They're not by blood. This isn't a heredity. Nor by the will of the flesh. Not by how will, like strong you are, how good you are. Blasphemy. That you gotta understand, that means that ye, Jesus didn't have to die for you. Why did he even bother coming? That means you didn't need God. You need God for the next breath. Forget COVID 19. You need God for the next breath you take. Oh no, I don't. Really? If you drop dead, please go outside the door. I don't like dead things in the, in the chapel. You need God for the next breath you take. Right? Nor by the will of men. No man willed it. No man did anything to help it. People, crowds of people didn't help you. What? Get saved? Who did it? But by God. But by God. God's goodness, God's glory, God's mercy, God's pity. God saved you. And as many as, what, received him, and this is the growth part. The growth part is, what, salvation, God knows who saved. Uh, God knows who saved. I don't know who saved. I'd look at anyone, even, the, even when you're backslidden, even when I'm backslidden. I don't know who saved. God knows that. God knows those who are his, doesn't he? I'm not to judge another man's servant. I don't know if you're saved or going to get saved, Right? 
There's always hope as long as we live in the acceptable day of the Lord, isn't there? And therefore we preach a Savior and the hope of the world. And what? Acceptance. That God accepts you, not the way you are, but he accepts you. And he wants to what? Take you from what you are and make you what? Like he is. Which gets the disease of sin out of your life. Which calls all the sicknesses in life. All the mental illness in life. All the broken families in life. He wants to make you whole. Civil. Moral. Like he is. And so as many as received him at salvation. Now we go following and growing in the light. Walking. You understand the meaning of walk in the light? Because the light will help you grow. You understand that when you grow, God wants you to go. This is a moving thing. Light always moves. Light always has, what, revealing power, but also, what, growing power, increased power, and that you're called to walk in the light and be a proclaimer of the light like John the Baptist was. And you're supposed to not be ignorant because you have the logos, the knowledge of God in your heart and mind. You have the light of God, which is the power of God, revealing the world around you, but revealing the spiritual world of light. And you know what? You're going to face a dark world, but the darkness can't overcome the, the light. A match always lights up in darkness. Light will never, or darkness will never overcome it. But also you have the saving power of God. Which no matter what you go through, whether it's COVID-19, whatever you want to believe, God is saving you progressively in that power. And he gives you the power not just to live in bios life, but Zoe life. And he makes you not just a living being, but he gives you in 1 Corinthians 15. He wants to create you a life-giving spirit. I don't know, I love this time of year. I love giving. I love being able to give that God has given me. I love being increased and being able to give gifts to men like God did. It's a mirror of that. God wants me to be giving. But you know what? It's that type of it's that time of year that you focus on. God so loved the world that he what gave. And I'm a life giving spirit. So you can give money to a missionary. But isn't it great that you have the power? Through God, as an ambassador of him, not to save anybody, but to bring Jesus to people. Isn't that incredible? What a gift. I just can't, well, hey, somebody needs some money. I, well, I have money. Money comes, and money goes quicker, doesn't it? But how about the ability... To be a witness like John the Baptist and be a light in the world and bring a life-giving spirit and take somebody from darkness, like somebody maybe took you from darkness. I remember the person that led me to Christ. I don't know if you do. The person that took you from darkness as an ambassador to light. And somewhere in between that sphere of Bios and Zoe life, faith was born. Because Logos came in. Knowledge and light came in, and then what life came in. And now I'm not just a bios person, I'm a Zoe life giving spirit, and what a privilege. That's the greatest Christmas gift you can get. Do you realize that? What do you get for Christmas today? You got the logos, the knowledge that God made you. A life. What's the greatest thing you can give? Money? God made you with the potential, if you want to walk in the light, to be a life-giving spirit. Wow. Forever and ever and ever. Amen? What a privilege we have that's wasted, that we're ignorant of. That we don't see. And we don't value. May God hold us blameless on that day. When he judges the quick and the dead. And may we be this Christmas season. All that God died for us to be. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father we thank you for the first part of this message. Oh your word. And your light. In all that. 
such glory, such life, you are rejected still. I pray not with us, Lord. I pray we have a little more of you today. We accept you a little more. We, we accept you, and we also respect the responsibility, which means we respond to the ability that God is giving us. And if we say it has given us potential energy, may it become like light kinetic energy and move and go. Because in Him we live and breathe, as Paul would say to the Greeks, and we have our being. May our being be of you more than anything else. Keep us today by your power, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay, guys, Merry Christmas. Bless somebody. Amen.